your Bible this morning, I'm going to have you turn to the same passage of Scripture that Brother Miller had you turn last week. I'm going to preach his message over... No, I'm not going to do that. But I, I got a little message. Um, usually the messages I get have uh, seven points and then subpoints. I don't know why seven's a good number, but this message only has two points. 300 subpoints, but only two points. No, it's just two points. So, you know, might be five minutes and done. I don't know. We'll see how it turns out. I doubt that. There, there's very few preachers ever go just five minutes. But anyway, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, verse 17 to verse 24. Titled the message is Two Thresholds for the Believer. Two thresholds for the believer. Mark chapter 9, starting at verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He, answered, he answereth him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this man came unto him? Or since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus saith unto him, If thou canst believe... All things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now. Father, may we see that there are two thresholds uh, to the believer, two things we need to uh, step through and uh, overcome and accept. And Lord, it, it just happens. It seems like it just happens in stages in a Christian's life. I pray, Father, we see this. I pray that you bless it. I pray that you bless the visitors and may they get something from it. And uh, just pray, Lord, that uh, you be lifted up and glorified this morning. And we ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Threshold. I, I, here's another word study. I'm on a downward slide here when you start doing nothing but word studies. <laughs> Behold. Behold, yeah. Threshold. The level or point at which you start to experience something or at which something starts to happen or change. And the first threshold we're going to talk about is the threshold of faith. I mean, that's the first one you got to step through. That's the first one that has to have uh, an effect on your life, and it's the first one you've got to, you've got to uh, step over. It says, if thou, he said to this man, if thou canst believe. If you can believe it. And that's the most important thing. Sometimes we get... Uh, works ahead of faith. Sometimes we think that it's all about the work when it's about the faith. That's the most important thing. And believing God is the greatest, it's the greatest challenge for the lost and the saved. It's a challenge for the lost because they have to, they have to believe that Jesus Christ came here, died on the cross for their sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. Because if they don't believe that, they can't be saved, right? But then there's another challenge, and that's for the believer, after he's saved, to believe what God said. And it is like, this, this is where the greatest trouble is. You know what the two greatest problems we have in this world? Sinners that won't believe God and get saved, and, and saved people that won't believe the Bible. And between those two things, that's the reason why this world's in the shape it's in. It is on us. It all degraded because we let it degrade. If preachers and pastors and evangelists and teachers and Sunday school teachers had been preaching this book and the whole book, we wouldn't see a nation in the shape it's in. Because when it was being preached, when it was being presented, we had a great country, at least better than anything else that was out there. Now it's going the other direction. You have to believe the gospel to be saved. John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. There's no works involved there. It's just believing it. But you know, that's a threshold. Some folks have a, 
head knowledge. They might believe that Jesus existed back there. He's a great revolutionary, which he wasn't. Uh, that he's a great teacher, and he was. But they don't apply anything spiritual to it. It's just a head knowledge of some figure in history instead of a Savior that came from heaven. And they don't, they don't, they don't believe on him. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So you have to believe the gospel to be saved. But you know what? You have to believe the Bible to believe the gospel. <laughs> You've got to believe... At least most Christians believe, for some reason, that it's reliable enough to be saved by. Now, it's not reliable enough to live by. You're going to trust your soul to it, but then you're not going to trust everything else to it. Your never-dying soul, you'll trust to it. You see how many Christians are like, about 90, 90% of them out there? Maybe a little bit more than that? You have to believe the Bible to believe the gospel. Uh, uh, Paul wrote of Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's why we have a Sunday school, where they, those kids are made wise unto salvation. They'll eventually get saved. I mean, we've had, I mean it's, it's seldom that somebody that doesn't stick around here long enough, we don't see their kids get saved. You say, why? Because they're all the time getting the gospel. They're all the time being given scripture. And what? It makes them wise unto salvation. That's what it says. I don't believe that Paul led Timothy. I mean, he may, he, he may have gave him the gospel. But he, he was already primed and ready. Why? He had a good mother. He had a good grandmother. And they taught him the scriptures. You have to believe the Bible to grow in faith. And this is where most Christians stump their growth. They believe God, I mean, they believe God is so great and big and wonderful and, and, and just, he's just full of love. I mean, it's all they want to talk about, love. I mean, just love. But he can't keep a book. He's not intelligent enough to keep, what, a 1,500, 2,000 page book? Now, he can make the universe... But he can't keep a book. Why? Because we're still looking around for the best manuscripts. Some, I mean, they're buried over here and buried over there, and they're under this trash heap and under that trash heap. Usually something's in the trash heap is trash. Anyway, they're still looking for it, man. They still think they're going to find, they're going to find manuscripts that will give them the best translation. They're still looking around the dirt for something that God never lost. Because if he can't preserve a book, how's he going to preserve you? You have to believe the Bible to grow in the faith. 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. You're not going to grow an inch. Talk, talk about remaining a, a midget. Should I, can I say that? Remaining very small in the faith. Because you won't, you won't believe it. You won't read it. In most Christians' cases, we even got some that believe it, that just, that just don't read it. But a majority of those out there don't believe it. They believe some of it. It's like everything else. They want to cherry pick the Bible and pick out the best things about God and forget about all them negative things that he says. And I mean, there are a lot. you got to kick out about three quarters of the book. There's a lot of negative in this book. I think that's about all I talk about, right? I'm just trying to balance the thing, because I know you're going out there and you're hearing all the positive things, you know. So I'm trying to balance it out by just giving you this whole bunch of negative. I'm scared of the God of this book. Absolutely scared to death of Him. And I love Him. But I fear Him, make the hair on, my, on the back of my neck and my arm stand up, thinking about some of this stuff. Knowing that I'm in the hands of the living God. And I'm saved. He said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. And that's written to Christians. Christians are going to be terrorized when they're in His presence. You're going to see a being in all His glory, you're going to be terrorized. You're going to know what terror truly is. It's a fearful thing to be, into the, hand, to be in the hands of the living God. And I'm part of His hand. I'm not even in it. And I'm fearful of it. But I'll tell you what, I can believe Him. 
I can believe him to save me, and I can believe that book, what it says. No corrections. No substitution of words. I don't, don't, don't change the punctuation, the verse markings, the chapter headings. I just leave it just like it is. And believe every word of it. Well, what, what about when it contradicts? I haven't found one of those yet. Show me one. I found where, where the God of this book, the only time Jesus Christ ever rejoiced in Scripture is when He said that He thanked God that He hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. He was rejoicing in the fact that God was hiding it from a bunch of haughty people that thought they knew something. You believe that book, you're, you, you are, talk about a minority. You're a minority of a minority of a minority. But you have to believe the Bible to grow in the faith. You've got to believe it's inspired and preserved. He said in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He said that the man of God may be truly furnished unto all good works. Um, that's inspiration there. And you know, not one single Christian on this planet has a problem with inspiration. They believe God inspired the Bible. They will tell you. In fact, if you, if you want to check out a church's website, go to the part where it talks about the Scripture, you know, and their statement of faith, and they'll say that we believe the Old and New Testament in the original writings were inspired of God. Well, bless your heart. Well, bless your heart for believing that. The only problem with that is there is not one single autograph, original autograph in existence from Genesis to Revelations. I mean, you know the guys that penned it and wrote it down? Not one single original autograph exists. So when somebody says, we believe the Old and New Testament as it was written in the originals, they're telling you nothing. They believe no What they're saying is that they have never, in their Christian experience, ever held the Word of God in their hands. That's what they're proclaiming. I am holding the words of God in my hand. Why? Because I not only believe He inspired it, but I actually believe God's powerful enough, but wise enough, to preserve it. And that's what He claimed to do. He said over there in Psalms 12, 6 and 7, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them, the words, from this generation forever. Not the message, the words. The words are important. And there's, there are so much proof, I can't even believe we, we even have to talk about this subject anymore. Uh, with all the information that's out there about the King James Bible, and how God has used it and blessed it, how that it stands alone among all the other translations, because they're all full of leaven. And I can prove it to you. If you don't believe me, bring me one. I'll show you. It's not that difficult. I'll just go to John 3.16. Let's just start there, where they mess that up and make a lie out of it. We talked about that last week. It says that in the new translation, it says God gave His only Son. That's a lie. Adam's called the Son of God in Luke 3.38. Job 1 and 2, the angels are called the sons of God. Jesus Christ is not God's only Son, but He is His only begotten Son. None of them were born. Adam wasn't born. The angels weren't born. They were created. Jesus Christ is the first one born of God, the only begotten of the Father. You take out that word begotten, you make a lie out of it. You have to believe the Bible. You have to believe it's inspired and preserved. Um, that all good things are possible for your life. You know that's what he's saying to him. He said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Well, it's obvious that bad things can happen to you whether you believe it or not. But he's talking about good things. He's talking about positive things. He's talking about spiritual things. He said, all things are positive if you can believe me. A lot of people don't. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I think when you get in this book enough, your desires becomes God's desires, and you see those desires happening right in front of your eyes. 
I know it's been true in my life. I mean, I cannot complain. If everything went downhill from here, and God forbid that it should, but if it did, I still couldn't complain. I might a little. I'm a complainer. But I shouldn't because God has been very good to me. Uh, he's, not taking, he's taking care of all my needs and some of my wants. I can't ask, I can't ask for more. He can always, listen, if anybody did, that, that got shorted on this deal, he got shorted because I'm the one that shorted him. And I, I wish that wasn't so. But I'll tell you what, he's given me the desires of my heart, but you have to believe the book. And listen, first and foremost, you have to believe God to please God. I'll let that sink in, because the next thing, the next threshold we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about it, but the first thing's first. You've got to believe him. In other words, all the good works in the world would not satisfy God if there's no faith. And faith is just believing what he wrote right here. Okay, now I realize that you can believe it, not really act on it. We'll talk about that next, but I'm talking about just believing it. Okay, when, when you come across something, you know, and it's just, you're reading it and going, wow, how can that be? Do you believe it? You say, why don't me, maybe you don't understand it. Here's what I tell God. I don't understand it, but I still believe it. Now show me what to believe. Show me. There's, there's, it, it's, it, there's some things that God, I'm, you know, I go to Ezekiel and half the time I'm lost. So there's some stuff in Zechariah. I have no idea what it's talking about. I mean, it's just so far, far over my head, but there's rare that I don't find something. God will show me something. If you don't believe him, he's not going to show you anything. This book is not something that you can, uh, it's not like a, something an engineer could just kind of take apart and, and, and dissect and just figure it out block by block. You see, this thing's interpreted by the Holy Spirit. And if he doesn't want to give you light, he'll shut you off like a light switch. And you will see absolutely nothing. And then you're, you are stuck in the word studies. Okay? Pray for me. Don't we'll get stuck in the word studies. Let's study the word love and agape and feeling. You know, I mean, they just, they just waste your time. I keep my heart open to this. I wouldn't know anything God didn't show it to me. And I want God to keep showing it to me. And I know one thing, that if I'm going to please God, the first thing, I've got to believe Him. He said in Hebrews eleven six, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is. He is what? He's God! And He can keep a book! No matter what problems and difficulties you throw in the way that it couldn't possibly have... No, what are you talking about? It's God. He can do what He wants. If He says He took... He, 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 uh, if he says that he um, tried him seven times, I had to think of the verse. If he purified it seven times, he purified it seven times. The universal language is English. You measure time, Greenwich Mean Time from England. You measure where your location by Greenwich Mean Time, which is zero longitude. You measure heat energy called a British Thermal Unit from England. You date, time, place. It's a place where standards came from for the world. Guess what this is? It's the absolute standard that God has for the world. And it came out of England. So first and foremost, you have to believe Him to please Him. <clears throat> and when I say believe Him, I mean all of it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Man, there's some ugly things in the Bible. Not just cherry-picking the parts that every religious charlatan uses to get an offering every Sunday. They want to make sure they don't, they don't, oh, they don't cause anybody to have any distress. I'm here to distress you. I mean, that's, that, that, that's my, it's my whole calling. It's so that you're aware of what's going on. I mean, would you want me to tell you that everything's going to be all right? The world is just going to be wonderful. Everything's going to go well. <laughs> I'd be lying to you, wouldn't I? <clears throat> when he says, believe it all, believe it all. Do you know what Jesus Christ said to the disciples? They were on the road to Emmaus. <laughs> he said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
You see, they were slow of heart to believe what the prophets had spoken. He said, you're fools. Believe it all. Believe it all, because God wrote it all. That's the first threshold. It's one thing to believe enough to get saved. It's quite another to believe everything that God said there, because, man, it will go against some of your grain. I promise you that. <laughs> There's things said in there. You know, if a lost person read it to you, you'd be going like, I mean, I could probably sit down and explain some things, some things I, I'd have difficulty with. When he said, you know, about the Amalekites, he said, go kill them, man, woman, child, ox, suckling, and ass. What are you going to say to that? When you first see that, you say, is that in the original, Lord? <laughs> Do you really mean that? And you have to stand there and you have to say, I believe that. Even though you're going, in your mind, you're going, Lord, that, that, that thing doesn't fly too well across the pulpit. But then as you go along, and this is what happened to me, I'm talking 25 years, 30 years later, happened to be reading along, and I'm reading in Esther, and I'm studying Esther. In fact, I was teaching Esther, and it talked about a fellow named uh, Haman the Agagite. And I remember there was one of them they didn't kill back there, and that was uh, the king. What was his name? Agag. And Samuel catches up with Agag, ends up hacking him to pieces with a sword. That's kind of gruesome. And I'm thinking, man, the, the violence here, Lord, the violence. But then we find out that one of this guy's prodigy, prodigy one of this guy's from his line, shows up in the book of Esther, and you know what he's got the king to do? To sign a decree to kill every Jew from the Nile all the way to India. It was going to be a genocide the world had never seen. And it's because they didn't kill Agag. See, the Lord knew that. See, the Lord's got, Lord's standing back there seeing this thing from a lot broader uh, uh, position than you are. He saw what was going to happen. He said, so when you go in there, kill them. Man, woman, child, ox, suckling an ass. Kill them all. Why? Or they're going to come back and try to kill you. All of you. A little Bible study helps with that. I can believe God. I believe that He's righteous. I believe that He, he does everything right. And I can trust that and believe that. Because if He's not, we're all sunk. I mean, if God's not doing right, <laughs> it's all over with. <laughs> he is. All right, let's talk about the next one. Threshold of believe in the gospel, then a threshold of believe in the Bible. And really, that's kind of like two points. And then, but this is really just the next one's a threshold of performance. I like what, I like what this man says. It, it, it kind of chokes me up every time I read it. It's like uh, reading about the, uh, um, the Syrophoenician woman over there in Matthew 15. I can't read that thing without getting choked up. And this one is, you know, he says, Lord, I believe... And he's saying it with tears in his eyes, help thou mine unbelief. And I'm like, what that, what's that about? That, it's a profound statement. Sometimes you can believe something, but not believe it enough to act on it. He said, I believe you, but help my unbelief. I feel the same way. I, I cried out the same thing. Lord, I believe you. Now help my unbelief. Why? Because I'm not performing like I should. I say I believe it, but then I don't do it. Right? A threshold of performance. Do you believe God enough to act upon it? All has to do with faith. But, and listen, this is true with Christians who are newborns. I don't expect newborn Christians to do almost anything. Just sit there and listen. Sit there and just absorb it and get it in. Why? Because... There's that threshold of believing, and then there's that threshold of performance. And it's going to take some time before you see any real performance out of them. And God knows it takes years to perfect that performance, or even try to get it to where it's acceptable. The same faith that caused you to repent and believe 
is the same faith that caused you to do something for the Lord. But it just seems like it. Look, look at 1 John 5.13. 1 John 5.13 says, most of you know it by heart, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. That's pretty clear. These things are written so we can know for sure, not to be having to guess about whether we're saved or not. But notice it says, and, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Didn't we just cover that? You know what he's saying? you got to believe on Him so that you can believe on Him. You can say to someone, I believe you. That don't mean you believe in Him. With the Lord, you can believe on Him, but not necessarily believe in Him enough to live for Him. A lot of Christians like that. Just as saved as you and I. But they didn't believe Him enough to change the direction of their life, change and make decisions for their life, the right decisions, evidently they didn't believe Him enough. There's a threshold there. Now you know there's no, there's no works to do with salvation because it's all based on Christ's works. It's just, it's just faith. But it is still that same faith. What does the Bible say? Faith without works is dead? I told someone, somebody one time, I said, do you believe in works salvation? I said, Absolutely. Faith without works is dead, but it just wasn't my works. It was His works. My faith. And He actually gives me the faith as a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But it's the same faith. The same faith that saved me is the same faith I'm living by today. Paul made it clear that performance in his flesh, or in this flesh, is a challenge. Uh, Romans 7.18, probably one of my favorite verses because it consoles me. It consoles me that if Paul had a problem, then, then maybe there's hope for me. <laughs> he said in Romans 7.18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You do understand that, right? You're not trying to reform something that can't be reformed, are you? You're not trying to change over a new leaf something that can't be changed. The flesh is the flesh. It never changes. It might get worse, but it never gets better. You do know that, right? You're not trying to change something that can't be changed, are you? You know what you're to do to it? Reckon it dead. That's the only thing you can do is just reckon the thing dead. And don't listen to the appetites. Don't listen to, I mean, because it'll steer you wrong. The flesh will, will, will jump in even on a spiritual good time and ruin it. <laughs> He said, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. You want to do the right thing, don't you? But how to perform that which is good, I find not. I can't, I can't, I can't even imagine all the times that I've thought that or said that to myself. How many of you know to read your Bible? How many of you perform it every day? How many of you know it's, it, that you should pray every day? The Bible says pray without ceasing. That means there's never a time when you're not praying. I'm not talking about continual state of prayer. I'm talking about sometime during the day you're praying. How many of you do that? How about witnessing? How about giving? See, all of a sudden now there's that performance thing. <laughs> Well, if you believe him, you trust in your soul with him. You know that, look and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10 to 12. Now, you can reckon the flesh dead, but it seems like it hollers a lot for a dead person. And uh, it, it'll give you all kinds of problems. But you're to, you know what, you're to marshal on. You're not to give in. Don't let it defeat you because it will. You keep thinking you're going to change it. I know you do. It's like a, it's like a woman saying she's going to change her husband. 30, 30 years later, you know, probably she's turned into what he is, you know, not the other way around. Um, they say you start to look alike. I don't know that that's true, and I'm not going to insult anybody. Say that sometimes they say you start to look like your pet, you know, your dog or your cat. 
Now, I'm not going to say anything to anybody. I don't know if that's true. But notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10 to 12, and this is where we find Paul prodding the Corinthian believers to cross that threshold of performance. He said, And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, that word means necessary, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted. In other words, God accepts it, that you're willing to do it. I mean, he's, I mean, that pleases God. That took faith to do that. But now, eventually, he says, now, perform the doing of it. I mean, if you have the ability to do it, then you need to perform the doing of it. And the Corinthian church had promised and said that they were going to give. Uh, they were going to give to the poor saints of Jerusalem and that they were going to uh, provide for their relief. Now, Paul's telling them, perform the doing of it. He says, I'm going to send somebody along to collect it. <laughs> He goes, but you told us, I said, you encouraged us when you said that you were going to help. You encouraged everyone, but now perform the doing of it. You know, a willing heart's a good thing, but remember, talk is cheap also. Be careful what you tell God you're going to do, because He really does expect you to do it. <laughs> yes, God actually expects you to do what you say you're going to do. You've got to be careful what you tell Him you're going to do. And be careful... Never say, um, uh, I swear, don't ever do that. Because then the devil says, you do what? And he'll throw every roadblock in your way to keep you from fulfilling that which you just swore that you'd do for God. Um, for if there first be a willing mind, is accepted according to a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. God's not asking you to do anything that you don't have the ability to do or the uh, substance to do. He's asking you to do what you can do, what you said you can do, what you said you will do. And I realize some of that is by the power of God. Listen, when you, when you accept a call to the ministry and a call to preach, <laughs> you have no idea how dependent you are on God. I mean, if, if I got up here and God departed, it'd be over with. It'd be over with that quick. I need him every message. At least, some, at, least, at least help me get something across. One point. But without him, done. It's all over with. Now this is one thing. You can be confident that God will perform his part until the day of Christ. He said in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. When he started, when he saved you, there is something going on within you. You said, what well, part of it is being conformed to the image of His Son. You're in that process. Now, one of these days, the rapture will take care of all of it. But you know He wants you to be conformed to the image of His Son now. And He's in the process of doing that. Day by day. Now, you can make it hard. You can make it harder. You can make it downright difficult. But it is the will of God that you be conformed to His image. And He's performing a good work within you. He wants you to help him. <laughs> Read some Bible. Trust him to do something for him. Perform. When you believe God and I mean every word, he promises to perform on your part. This is where it gets exciting. And this is where when you, you cross that threshold uh, of faith for salvation, you get saved, and then then you realize you not only are saved now, but you've got a Bible. I mean a real Bible with pure words in it. And then God, when, when God is pleased with that, He begins to perform on your part. Let me give you a verse here. Luke chapter 1. And we're going to end with this. I think I've only taken a half hour. Somebody mark that down. We'll send that. It's a record now. Luke chapter 1, verse 44, he says, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. 
and blessed is she that believe uh, and blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which are told her from the Lord and Mary said my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my savior it says because blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord he not only performed that for uh, for Mary, but also for uh, Elizabeth. It is Elizabeth, right? Okay. When you believe God, there's a performance on His part in your life. That's when you start seeing God moving. You know what the rest of the world thinks you're crazy, and you know, I'm not crazy. I know God did that, and you do. Why? You believe in Him, you believe in that book, and you watch God perform. Listen, you perform for Him, He'll perform for you. You Listen, you get into him, he'll get into you. That's the way it works. God becomes real to those that avail themselves of God, believe God, do what God wants. If there be first a willing mind, it is accepted. That's where it starts. Just be willing. So I just don't, just be willing. God will take care of all the rest. When I got saved, I didn't know, I, I, don't, I think, other than what I read on that track, I didn't know a verse of Scripture. I don't ever remember memorizing any verse in the Bible about anything. You, I, you said, find this book. I wouldn't even know it was in the Bible. And I almost got sidetracked because of some of the brethren. But it was a pastor who brought me back. And I said, well, there's a correction over here in Romans 8.1. I remember the verse. Now I see where I was so dead wrong I couldn't believe it. But I'm mimicking what somebody told me. And that preacher looked at me and said, there, there's no errors in that Bible. I said, what? <laughs> he goes, there's no errors in that book. I said, oh. There's no. He said, God wrote that book. Oh, okay. So now I just believe him. And so it's surprising how those verses work out. And you see, oh, man, I got that thing wrong. It's right there in the text. It's right there. You just believe God. You just believe that he can. That's what he says. Believe that he is. You just believe who he is. But I'll tell you what, if you're here today and you haven't crossed that threshold for salvation, for believing on him, that's where it begins. Until you've done that, not going anywhere. God can't use you. He can barely bless you. He can bless you somewhat, if, you know, especially if you're in a Christian family. But listen, you need to cross that threshold. Let's have every, uh, let's all stand, let have every head bowed, every eye closed just for a second. And I just want to ask, I would be remiss if I didn't ask. And I probably had, ought to have uh, more altar calls than I do. But, with every head bowed, every eye closed, is there someone here today, and I'm not going to mince words, I'm just, preacher, I heard what you said.